Good morning. Today is Tuesday, May 4th, 2021. We are in the middle of two mitzvahs, two commandments of counting. In last week's Torah portion, we saw the mitzvah of counting the Omer. That means to count the days from Passover to Shavuos. We count 49 days. Today is the 37th day of the counting. When we get to day 50, that's Shavuos. So that's a mitzvah for Jews to count these days. In this week's Torah portion, the Parsha of Bahar, we have another mitzvah of counting, and this one is counting years. During the time when the temple was standing in Jerusalem, there was a mitzvah that the uh, uh, the Sanhedrin, the great court in Jerusalem, would count each year. And then at the end of 49 years, they would count the 50th year. And the 50th year was Yovel, the Jubilee year. And that's the subject of the portion this week of Bahar. So we have a mitzvah to count days, ending with the 50th day that is Shavuos. A mitzvah to count years, ending with the 50th year that is Yovel, the Jubilee year. The two mitzvahs are so similar, but they are dramatically different. And the difference can be seen in the grammar. In last week's Torah portion, the words were, Usafartem lachem, and you should count for yourselves in the plural, 49 days from Pesach until Shavuos. Safartem Lachem, those are the plural forms. You, plural, should count. However, in our parsha, the Torah says, the Safarta Lacha, you, single individual, should count 49 years. Why is it that in counting days, the Torah tells us in plural, in counting years, it is singular? So Rabbi Jonathan Sachs suggests, along with other scholars who make this point, that the mitzvah to count the Omer, counting 49 days till Shavuos, is a mitzvah that applies to every single Jewish person. And so therefore, everyone has to do it. So it's said in the plural, to all you Jewish people, all of you should count. But the mitzvah of counting the years that is counted up to the 49th year and then the 50th year's Jubilee, that mitzvah is not for every individual. That mitzvah is only for the Sanhedrin, the great court that met in a courthouse adjacent to the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, that met as one unit that represented the entire Jewish people as one. And therefore, since it was a single entity that did the counting of the years, it is expressed in the, in the singular. You, the individual entity that represents the entire Jewish people, Safar Telecha, you count. And here is a really important principle of life. As individuals, we count days. I need to know what I'm doing today. I need to know what I'm doing tomorrow. Thursday, I'll tell you the truth, I'm really not up to because I'm pretty much focused on today and a little bit tomorrow. A private person, an individual, thinks about days. But when we are a leader, our role is to think long-term, is to think what's going to be next year, or in five years, or in 25 years. The famous line in Pirkei Avos, Ben Zoma says, Ezehu Chacham. Ben Zoma asks, who is wise? Haroa es hanolad. He who sees that there will be things born in the future that we do not even envision yet, whose view is of what will happen far into the future. The truth is, we see models of this type of leadership where the thinking is about the future many times in the Torah. One of them I've shared with you before. Just before the Jewish people are about to leave the land of Egypt, Moshe gives a speech. And you think about what might have been on Moshe's mind at that moment, at the moment of freedom and liberty and leaving Egypt and going to Sinai. And instead, Moshe's speech focuses on getting the Jewish people to think about 
How are you going to tell this story to your children in the next generation? How will you frame what we are going through now 25 years from now? That's an aspect of leadership that looks at not just what is happening now, but how will it be perceived in the next generation? I want to give you one more example. And this example is an incredible, incredible example. So every week on Shabbos, we have the Torah portion and then we have the Haftorah. Haftorah is a section from the prophets that we read. The selection of the passage from the prophets that we read as the Haftorah every Shabbos relates to the theme of the Torah portion, but also it's a message that is supposed to be inspiring. It's supposed to be uplifting. It's supposed to be uh, arouse our emotions. Now, this year, this Shabbos, we read the double portion of Bahar Buchukosai, double portion. Most years, this is a double portion, and we have a general rule whenever there's a double portion, the Haftorah is the Haftorah of the second Parsha. So this year, we're going to read the Haftorah for Buchukosai, the second of the two Parshias. Once in a while, the two parshios are split, especially in a Jewish leap year where there are more Shabbases, four more Shabbases. Sometimes Bahar and Buchukosai are separated, each one on its own Shabbos. And when that happens, Bahar has its own Haftorah. Most people are not so familiar with the Haftorah for Bahar because most years we don't read it. And this year we do not read it. But some years we do read it and it is worth paying attention to because it is truly inspiring, but in a very subtle way. So here's what I want to do. I want to tell you the story of the Torah that would be for the Parsha of Bahar if it was read alone, which of course relates thematically to what we just discussed, the mitzvah of counting the years to Yovel, to the Jubilee year. Here's the story. I'm going to leave out a few details on purpose in order to make my point. God called to the prophet and said, there's a person named Hanamel and he's going to come to you and he's going to say to you, I want you to buy a field. So the prophet tells us, Hanamel, this man came to me and he said, buy a field. And the prophet says, I knew this was God's word. God said, someone's going to come to you and say, buy a field. Someone comes and says, buys a field. He knows that's what God wants. Okay, let's go further. So the prophet says, and I bought the field and I weighed out the money to him. I signed the deed. I sealed it. I called witnesses. I weighed the money on the balances. Then I took the deed of purpose, which had been sealed containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. And I delivered the deed to Baruch, the son of Neria, in the presence of Hanamel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase and in presence of all the Jews who sat in the court of the guard. Okay. <laughs> Has anyone been inspired <laughs> or excited so far by that Haftarah. I think the only person that could be excited about that Haftarah is a professor of law who teaches contracts. If you teach contracts in law school, wow, oh my goodness, wow, a passage in the prophet that describes in detail how the contract works and how the sale works and the witnesses and the contract, ah, fantastic. But for everybody else, it's a little dry. <laughs> I got to admit, it's a little dry. It's a little dry until we supply the following details. Who is the buyer of the field? The Navi, the prophet. The buyer of the field is Yirmiyahu Navi, Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah the prophet is the one who prophesied that the temple, the Beit HaMikdash, was going to be destroyed. And this prophecy came to him just before the destruction of the temple. Now, let me ask you a question to everyone who is a real estate maven. What do you think happened 
to the price of real estate as the destruction of the temple came closer and closer. Because remember, it was well known, it was well prophesied, there was a siege for years before, it, nobody was surprised by this, it was clear that it was coming. What do you think happened to the value of real estate as the Chorban got closer? And God says to Yermio, I want you to buy a field. Why would you buy a field? When the Jewish people are going to exile. And remember, I'm not talking about short term. Yermio prophesies that the Jewish people will be in exile 70, 100 years. And then as we know in history, that we came back for the second temple for about 400 years and then another exile for 2,000 years. So let's turn to the end of this Haftorah. Because the people around Yermio ask him this question. What are you buying a field for? And there was one more condition. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. I apologize. One more detail to the technical sale after it was witnessed and signed and the money was paid and the contracts were drawn up. One more detail. Thus says God, the Lord of hosts, take these deeds, the deed of purchase, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may last a long time. Put them in a time capsule and hide it. Because thus says Lord God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be bought again in this land. You could call this insider trading. You think that the value is low and you think that it's never going to come back because this destruction, this exile is going to be permanent. I got him promising you, you want a good investment tip? Buy land now when it's cheap because I promise you the Jews are coming back to Israel and it will be very, very valuable. And this is what Yermio says. He says, God says, I brought the Jewish people out of Egypt with signs and wonders. And Yermio says to God, you gave them this land, the land of Israel. You said that we would inherit this land and we came in and we possessed it, but we did not listen to you. And we did not walk in your laws. And therefore you have sent God this evil upon us. And see the sieges around us now of our enemies who are fighting us. And they will triumph. We are going to lose this. But what you, have, what you God have said has happened, will happen. Buy the field and call witnesses. Even though the city is now being given into the hand of the enemy, then God's words came to Yermio saying, Behold, I am God, the Lord of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? You will return to it. It doesn't look like it. I'm telling you it's true. It's a sound investment. Short term, it doesn't make any sense. Short term, you're going to lose everything. It will have no value at all. That's why you have to hide that deed in a place where it will not be disturbed for a hundred years. But long term, after a hundred years, your descendants will be able to take it back. And even longer, 2,000 years later, those descendants, that means us, you and me, will be able to take it back. We'll be able to hear finally the words of the prophet, Vishavu Vanim Ligvulam, that your children will turn to your borders. Think long term. Count years, centuries, millennia, and you will see that this is, in fact, a smart purchase. We need to do both. We need to count days to get through today and tomorrow and the next day. We're individuals. We have to plan for today and tomorrow. But we have to learn from our Parsha that we also need to count years. What is my five-year plan? Where do I hope to be in five years? What is my 25-year plan? Where do I hope to be? Who do I hope to be in 25 years? And what must I do now to reach that goal? That's the difference between counting days of the Omer and counting years of the Yovel, days plural, years singular. 
We need both. We need to recognize the need to count days for each of us, but as leaders within our own lives and our own families and our own communities, we also have to count years. We have to be able to see what's ahead and plan for the future. That's the lesson we're taught by the change in grammar in these two mitzvahs of counting that we have. My friends, I want to wish you a great day and I look forward to seeing every one of you soon in person.